opinions on the Super Bowl, like, you know what? Everybody has one. Turns out not only do human beings have an opinion on the Super Bowl, but so do horses. That's a horse by the name of Cannon Stone, affectionately known as Stone, who is owned by our chief operating officer and chief executive officer, Aiden Butler. But you can see as he walks out of his stall and has two... Uh, Two, two buckets to choose from. Lo and behold, which one does he walk to and uh, eat some grub out of? None other than the Kansas City Chiefs. We'll see if Stone happens to be correct today. Kickoff, of course, is 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. But on the human side, our seminar guest today is more than just a human's ass. He's actually the announcer for Sandy. He's a good friend of mine. And take a look at this. It's not often that I get outshined by a better shirt than what I have. But this has to be a one-of-a-kind type of shirt, Frank, right? Come on. You've never worn this ever in your life before. One and done. I got it for uh, for this seminar in particular with my main man, Montgomery B. And uh, we were both laughing as we bought this. And I said, this is coming on my next seminar. Uh, now, now with, you know, with, Super Bowl day is obviously festive, right? We're here yeah. to have fun. We're here to make money on the races, of, of course. course. But, of course, everybody's interested in the Super Bowl. Now, you have an opinion on the Super Bowl. And I just wanted to ask you, you keep uh, close uh, tabs on your record from previous Super Bowls? Are you O for the last 10 years? Are you 50-50? Are you undefeated? Like, what's your track record like with previous Super Bowl predictions? I've been better in recent years. As a kid, you know, I have some very bad memories, particularly when I was in high school, uh, two real beatings uh, for uh, my selection. You were gambling real money back in high school? Unfortunately. I mean, it's all relative. You know, your allowance back then, it was uh, it, it's a lot less than uh, adult wagers, but it's a lot more impactful. It's the hard pumping, yeah. yeah. When you're on E, you're on E. It's that simple. E isn't empty. So uh, when the Redskins lost to the Raiders, that was a horrifying experience for me. Uh, I never liked the Raiders. My brother's favorite teams were the Raiders and the Marcus Steelers. Marcus Allen, I think, was on that yeah, team. Yeah, he was a great team. Joe Theismann with that horrific pass. I mean, that was unbelievable. That's as bad as it gets. Um, and then, of course, um, the other game was the um, Dolphins and the 49ers. Uh, where I fell into the Dan Marino hype job trap, and they got blown right out by the 49ers and Joe Montana, who, by the way, I regard as the greatest quarterback of all time. I was actually reading an article today, and I did not know this, but I read it this morning when I woke up early about Joe Montana and that he wanted to play more and that George Seifert was against him. So I'm automatically anti-George Seifert forever, and, and thinking back to him, to the fact that he would cut off what I thought was the GOAT. And believe me, as a kid, I was a Dallas Cowboys fan, so I was definitely not. And as an L.A. boy, never a 49ers fan. Like, I can't say I was a Rams fan, but the 49ers, if the Rams play the 49ers, got to go to the Rams. I mean, I'm born here. So it's not like I'm a 49ers fan, but from a respect standpoint, uh, George Seifert not letting him play is something that I, I was stunned to read. And it made me feel bad that that Joe has those thoughts because his thoughts should only be pure and joyous from his experience as a legend with the 49ers. Now, your high school days were many moons ago, and you talked about the hype. It's nothing like the hype leading up to this year's Super Bowl, right? I mean, it's 24-7. We've got Twitter. We've got Facebook, yeah. uh, cable channels, et cetera, et cetera. Does any of that uh, babble influence your opinion? No, I've watched the games through the year, and everyone comes with their opinion. The only thing I will say is that typically speaking from a gambling standpoint, People, and this is proven, uh, people usually make larger than usual bets on the Super Bowl because they want to make their statement. And I will say this from a man who's very experienced in this category, always wager responsibly is something I should say. And be careful because, let's face it, when you bet over your head, it's not pretty and you will get drowned. And it's not a pleasant experience trying to get out of those messes. So I, I just would highly recommend you calm down. And here's the thing that I have experienced. I've made some very large wagers in my time that I'm not proud of, I'm actually embarrassed about very large that are just ridiculous i can tell you this from my own personal experience is that a small bet win and a big bet win it probably does the same thing to the brain the part of the brain that gets happy when you win but the big bet versus a small bet creates a lot more angst and headaches that are unnecessary so when they say always wager responsibly i know that stuff gets kind of ignored it's just like a quick little thing or a disclaimer be careful because, uh, you know, you should bet with your head, not over it. And as uh, one of the companies I worked for said, no one to stop before you start. And pain's not worth the gain sometimes, right? You mentioned, you know, just that what gets, you, what gets you excited, but don't go crazy and mortgage the house. And, you know, if you're right, you're right. I think I think the thing about betting in general, is you want to be right. If you're right, you're going to get that satisfaction. It's not going to change your life. In the end, most people are probably going to be a little bit behind in their wagering because Tom comes with a very simple response to me whenever we talk about this 11 is greater than 10 it's an amazing concept but it happens to be true and as time goes on it'll grind you out it adds up
nevertheless, you still want to pick a Super Bowl winner and a good prop or two and try to be right on Super Bowl Sunday. Well, we want you to pick a Super Bowl winner, and I know you have a very strong opinion I on do. this year's edition, so why don't we kind of lay it out for the next uh, five minutes or so. The floor is yours. Well, I don't, I'm don't. i not going to go on for five minutes. No one wants <laughs> to hear that, including you or any of the of our audience. Depends how entertaining you are. I do like the Eagles in this case. I, I really like the Eagles a lot. I do like the Eagles a lot. I think they're going to blow them out. I actually read this morning. I was reading a lot. And, and I saw like all the newspapers and the sportscasters and their opinions. The highest point differential I saw in anyone's we talk about no one taking a stand. Like two people came with an eight point differential, but everyone's coming with these like 27, 24, 23, 20, 31, 28. Like make a statement. Like in, in this case, you're not really expressing yourself so strongly. It's if like a come, horse winning by a nose. Yeah, it's you're like the horse, so-and-so. like flight line. He's going to win by so open length. Yeah, I think the, Philly, the Philadelphia Eagles are going to blow them out today. I, I really believe this because I believe. Why? Defense wins championships. I don't think the Kansas City Chiefs could stop you and I. And I think that in the end, they might be scared to what the Jackson have on. They're not scared at all. Uh, Jacksonville almost beat them. Cincinnati should have beat them. I mean, that was really some officiating for the ages that, you know, at least the uh, NFL acknowledges some of that stuff, but they really need to make some changes when there's such. Look, on that game between the, and, and I wasn't like, I wasn't financially, but it didn't mean anything to me. But just watching that as a fan, and Rich, look, what are you talking about? The, the Cincinnati Bengals and the Chiefs. Okay. What I was, I was going through Twitter and it's I was always like, dangerous. No, because it's good to get a feel for what people are thinking that are watching the game. Fair enough. Highly respected writers with tremendous reputations were outraged with what they were sure. watching on television. And so I think the Bengals should have and deserved to win that game. And I'm not an Eagles fan at all, never have been. And I think they're kind of like, you know, I mean, this goes back to when I was a kid being a Cowboy fan. Remember the scab games when the, like the, yeah, the, the Eagles and Cowboys had some real, like those games always stand out as like dirty, dirty football. So I'm not an Eagles fan, but I just think in the end, the Eagles will blow them out today. I, I think that they're not going to be able to stop the run. I think the over on the run yards for the Eagles on, on all categories would be the way to go. And look, I want you to know that I definitely respect and believe Patrick Mahomes is already a legend. He's just an amazing guy. Not the GOAT yet. Not even close. Okay, some some do think he's the GOAT. Because everyone thinks everything is the GOAT. Every, bias. every last horse you saw was the greatest you've ever seen, the best jockey ever, the best quarterback, the best this, the, the best, best restaurant. That. Everything. Just everything is the best of the moment. But... He's great. If they can't figure out a way to stop Kelsey, I, I, you know, and part of it is I just can't stand the Kelsey screaming and yelling and all this stuff. They got to just shut him down and blow them right out today. I think the Eagles are going to win by 20. Gambling's personal to you. In other words, you choose a side sometimes based upon the human emotion. Uh, on the other side. Play. Yeah, I'm not a Chiefs guy. I mean, I can't I can't live with that whole thing. The tomahawk chop, the whole thing's got to go. And hopefully the Eagles will quiet them very, very uh, uh, dram- emphatically would be the word. Head coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, Andy Reid. He's I mean, a big Tommy Bahama fan. He's a... Doesn't that count for something? How many times did they zoom in on Andy Reid's face in those big games in the past when he was with the Eagles, when he's just stunned and absolutely shocked? At a, no one's lost more big games than Andy Reid. I know he's a lovable teddy bear and all this and that. In the end, I like the Eagles coach because that guy, I'm, I think he's going to want to run the score up to make a statement, and it'll be fun to watch. I think they're just going to run the ball right down their throat all day long. The thing about this is, unfortunately, these get televised. So, I mean, I'm, I know I'm setting myself up for some bad situations. <laughs> the archives will not yeah, be kind. If it's 14 nothing Chiefs, people are going to be laughing. And, and I realize that as a result of watching, the of the summer, there will be some people out there that will automatically be on the Chiefs based on this speech. And I don't blame them. A lot of people, you know, I have friends that go by who other people like. And then they decide if – Of course. And, and, and the, the general consensus – if you ask people, they're all saying the Eagles, but in the end, the line's only one and it's moved down. So a lot of big money is coming in on Kansas City. I think the big money on Kansas City is going to be right in the fireplace. Fade Frank Amer- Frank Maramati's <laughs> opinion at your own peril, but we're going to put Frank to work and find out who scratched off today's card. It's a really good eight-race card, by the way. The first post is at 11 a.m., but let's get those changes from Frank right now.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Santa Anita Park. The track is fast, the turf course is firm, the rail on the turf is at 20 feet. Here are the early changes on today's card. In the first race, start of the 50 cent early pick five, number seven, Elegance Code, make the jockey Frankie DeTori. Race one, number seven, Frankie DeTori. The second race kicks off the early pick four. Number two, only lightning, two pounds over. Turning to the third, start of the rainbow six, there's $54,952 in the jackpot carryover. In the fourth race today, there's no high five wagering with the scratches of four grit and curiosity and six tis lightning, four and six out of the fourth. In the fifth, number one, Woody, the jockey, Frankie DeTori. Frankie DeTori rides one, Woody. Six, brick a brack is scratched. Race five, scratch number six. In the sixth race, number four, Riverside, make the jockey, Kazushi Kimura. Kazushi Kimura rides number four, Riverside, in today's sixth race. Turning to the seventh, scratch number nine, Thunder Run. It's the start of the Golden Hour pick four. Race seven, scratch number nine. The eighth is the Lady of Shamrock. Number four, A.G. Bullet, the jockey Frankie DeTori. Race eight, number four, make the jockey Frankie DeTori. Those are the early changes on today's big game car. Eight race program. Enjoy your day. It kicks off at 11 a.m. in 58 minutes. We'll take a quick time out and return to Quigley's Corner. Welcome back. We're always we're talking with the always witty and entertaining Frank Miramati, our track announcer here at the Great Race Place. We're less than five and a half hours from kickoff to the big game, but we're less than an hour away from post time here. We better get down to business before our bosses scold, scold us and talk too much about uh, football as opposed to horse racing. But it's always a pleasure to talk about horse racing with you, Frank. And we kick things off here in race number one. The rails today are 20 feet. The distance is one mile in race number one. This is a race for Calbred. Phillies and mares maiden special weights. Also race one begins the 50 cent early pick five. As you heard Frank mention, make the jack in number seven, elegance code, Frankie DeTori. Number one, candy on top was the current, was the uh, original morning line favorite at two to one. However, the one taking the action is number three, Smart Monique, who's three to two on the tote board right now. A lot of these exit the same common race. You're going to take one of those runners, Frankie, you're going with a fresh face. Well, it's interesting. I, I I do believe that Smart Monique, if you ignored the tote board, certainly ran a great race last time in defeat. Um, I'm, I, I had to move away from that race in general, and, and I was very close to going to Candy on top. Let me say this. Candy on top, uh, our chart callers here, who are good guys, and I consider them both friends, they do a great job. They're very attentive. Like, they don't need a pat on the back for that. They're at Santa Anita Park. They're supposed to do a good job. But they really are on top of little, like, uh, subtle things that happen in races. This horse here, Candy, on top, you can't look. If you look on paper, you're like, wow, what a dismal performance this was. But it was really a, a race in which she couldn't find room. And it wasn't one of those obvious things where she was, like, steadying off horses' heels and this and that. It was just a miserable inside trip the whole way. And you can't hold it against her. And I almost picked her on top. I end up taking a little bit of a risk with my selection in number two, bold choice. And, and the you know, she has burnt some serious chalk. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again, Tom. One of my strongest angles of wagering is to go against horses who have entered stakes competition and then returned to maiden company. And the reason for that is, and I've said it numerous times on any platform that I've had, is because when that happens, typically they get bet hard because, wow, they're back with maidens. This is a 
an absolute textbook example of why that can be a bad experience. Um, last week on Sunday, the horse who won the first leg of the Rainbow Six was also one just like that, but she aired it out because it was such a um, a lesser field to be, to be gone. Runner. Correct. She couldn't lose on paper. Um, you know, I tried to beat her. I did too. I, I thought that she was beatable. Someone had sent me a text. Uh, a guy who likes some fancy shirts like this, in fact, sent me a text and uh, told me that he was singling that horse. And I said, I know, but I don't like that angle in general. Well, she has burnt chalk numerous times since. She ran on the turf one day when she was sprinting, Bold Choice did. And she was a little bit green, switching back and forth on her leads, a little bit clumsy. But I kind of liked the look of her. She's a good-looking filly for an 0 for 8 individual. And she's stretching out, which makes her the question mark, but she will probably get an easy lead, and maybe she won't goof around as much. I thought she finished with enough willingness to be dangerous in this spot. I went 2-1. Um, I don't have a strong view on this race, but I went 2-1 in that order. The number seven, Elegance Code, to me, can certainly improve, too, because she was coming off a long lap. But she didn't do much running that day, even though it was a comeback race and she probably needed it. Uh, Pratt was scheduled to stay aboard. He's just not going to make it back in time for this race. He is riding later on the day. I think this race, you could go several different directions. Personally, I'll be rooting for number five, Tiz My Princess, because my dear friend Mike Dermanuel owns her, and I'm not afraid to say that uh, the king of Fresno owns that filly, and uh, I hope he can get a win for her. Just to amplify about the trouble you mentioned, Frank, on your second selection, number one, Candy on top. She actually made Brad Freeze horses to watch. Here's what he said in abbreviated edition. He said that she was blocked the final quarter mile and to toss the race completely. Kind yeah. of justifying what you exactly said as exactly well. Exactly what you need to do. You can't look at this thing on paper, and that's why you have to watch. If, you, if you're going to take this seriously, in my opinion, ladies and gentlemen you must watch replays they're very accessible now online you, you got to watch the replays to get a feel for what really happened it can't possibly be summarized in print and look i say all that and there are many times i'll watch a race from you know new york or kentucky or somewhere never look at the thing and then you realize later like maybe you should have taken five minutes and look to see this horse is no good might have saved you more than five dollars way more Race number two, we're on the main track, one mile at the distance, 50 cent early pick four time. Maiden claiming three year old, uh, three year old Phillies in for a $40,000 tag. Number two, Jacqueline Cochran from the Steve Miotti barn is dropping down in class to maiden 43rd lifetime start going turf to dirt. Mr. Miotti, one for 15 up to this point, but he's always dangerous. Who do you like in uh, race two, Frank and why? This is a tough race because there's not a whole lot of form to go by. And so I'm going to go with a Philly number three, prestigious as my top selection. Now, Prestigious was very hard ridden out of the gate last time out from the get go. But in the end, in the final 16th, 8th to 16th of a mile, she finally started finding her stride. And it, it makes me think that perhaps the extra distance will do her some good. And, and she'll be closer to the pace because they're going longer. There's not much in this race. I thought she finished okay. In fact, in that race, uh, Mr. Aguilar, who rode the five Magic Capital, nearly blew third by standing up early. He's very lucky. It would have not been pleasant for him if Prestigious beat her in that photo. It was a very close photo. And uh, Prestigious did gallop out well. For, again, it's all relative with an asterisk. But I think if you're looking for a horse that might improve in this circumstance, she took some money last time, second time Lasix. The dam ran two routes, was third in one of them. Uh, you know, she's by a horse who was good routing. I'm, I'm going to go with prestigious over the four Jacqueline Cochran. I really don't have any opinion on Jacqueline Cochran. I just put her second, just thinking that, you know, this is a pretty soft bunch, but I like the three prestigious. You talked about so far race replays and pedigree, Frank, what percentage of your handicapping is basically allocated to those two disciplines? In other words, you know, and, and at some point pedigree kind of falls off the table because if they have 20 starts, it really doesn't matter at that point. Or like if you're in a maiden 16, you can't stop. You, what are you going to talk about this? You know, son of American Pharaoh, like, yeah, it didn't pan out for this son of American Pharaoh would be the better way to be real. Right. Um, to me, actually my number one, handicapping tool is to watch horses on the racetrack um I, I think there's that's very very important obviously you can't make multi-race wagers with that but i like to see their body language it's one of the last frontiers of handicapping in my opinion everybody's yeah. got their head buried in the racing form and as i like to say in the stock market past performances are not necessarily indicative of future performances when you invest in a stock index or things like that yep. in some cases that can be true of horse uh, horse racing as well they're leaving living living breathing animals it might be their day it might not they're trying to tell you from a body language standpoint we talk about this time and time again they're trying to tip you off and most people aren't actually even watching i'll sit down in the booth at the, on the couch and i'll, I'll be looking couch, at you got a couch in the booth it's a little love seat believe me it's not exactly uh some you know 
It's nothing extravagant. Okay. I can promise you. Not leather, anything like that. I mean, I, I, I really don't even know what it is, but okay. it's all right. It's, okay. it, 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 it keeps me fancy. I can fit on it. I would so, bet most announcer booths don't have couches. Would that be a fair statement? Mm, that's a good question. I would think the answer to the that ones be, you've been in. Yeah, okay, the answer. Fair. Monmouth has a red it's a great couch. race place. That thing's been there for forty years at Monmouth Park, and believe me, I never want to get anywhere near that thing. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll be sitting and looking at the TVs. And uh, Channel 29 here on track will give you all the tracks. So sometimes I'll just see watching races or just watching post parades and you see a horse and then it makes me look and I say, who is this? Horse. Because they have that game day. So there's a certain look I look for on horses that are either A, comebackers or B, um, first time starters. Something like that when they have the look and it's just, just it, it look, it's all subjective. So you got to decide for yourself what that look is. We have a great team here that tries to point that stuff out for you. And I would highly recommend listening to that because they know they've been on horses. They live with horses, right? Yep. Um, but to me, I like to see a certain look of, of positive energy and a game Alertness. face. Absolutely. And you do it all the time in the paddock. And I think you're very underappreciated because from the number of likes you give out. Like, okay. A lot of times the likes pour in after the race, not before. You know what I mean? Yeah, but anyway. I think it's very important. So to me, looking at them on the track, um, to me, trainer angles is very important. Like, you know, winners win, losers lose. This is just reality. And then, um, you know, the, but the replay to prepare, I find my handicapping is far stronger when I do these seminars with you because I do more work. Like on a typical day, I'll walk in, people say, who do you like? I'm saying, I'm sorry, I don't even know who's running today. I'll find out shortly because I don't try to overanalyze what's going to happen or try to predict this or predict that. This gets you in trouble. Trevor said it best. Open your eyes, tell them what you see. I do, you know, I've had a couple of guests in the booth the last couple of days. I show them that before the race, I take a quick peek to make sure if there are any storylines, i.e. a debut horse or someone stretching out or trying turf for the first time, those long layoff, those are important things to know. But in general, general you just want to go in with a fresh attitude i think watching replays is absolutely imperative let's start with a fresh attitude for the 20 cent rainbow pick six multiple winning tickets yesterday that means the jackpot single ticket carry over now up to fifty four thousand dollars we kick things off in race three going one mile on the turf course for phillies and mares thirty two thousand dollar claimers nine winners of two races lifetime number three dolly may from the john sadler barn written by our leading writer juan hernandez is the five to two morning line favorite talk to us about race three this is a very difficult race, and I think if you're going to get a price, it may very well come in this third race. To give you an idea, my original thought was to maybe go with number two, Ice Queen, because she ran okay last time out, and the filly who beat her was much the best consternation. Umberto Rispoli was on her last time. She was very wide, shouldn't have won with that trip, but still did. But I think the sneaky horse is number one, a crown for kitten, going back to Drayden Van Dyke, who rode her to a huge upset victory on November 25th down at Del Mar in a maiden 50. Last time out, she comes out of the same race that many of these did. And a crown for kitten had a sneaky bad trip. And in the end, she was finishing with a little bit of interest. Um, I thought that she could have been closer. She was a little eager at times. And going into this whole equation, she's 15 to 1. And you're going to get a nice solid price on her. So I think she's worth considering. Is she the most likely winner? Of course not. She would never be 15 to 1 if she was. But I think reunited with Van Dyke, who has ridden her to two you know, of her better performances. In fact, her two best finishes have been with Drayden aboard. And coming out of that race where I think she might have the most upside, I went with her. And then in trying to stay away from that race in general, because I wasn't overly uh, enthralled with anything I watched out of that heat on January the 13th. Number seven, sensible move with D for Dean Pedersen. I almost put her on top because if you look back, when she broke her maiden against Calbreds, it should be noted, however, she was just five to two with Armando Ayuso aboard, who's not exactly a household name down at Del Mar, right? And, and so she was still well bet. So she was fancied in that spot, and she did win, and she's, you know, among the more lightly raced. She, In fact, she is tied for being lightly raced with uh, two others that have each had eight starts. In these kind of races, I'll usually want the one who has run, you know, the least number of times. So I went 1-7, but the whole point of that, you got to spread in this race. Like, I understand Dolly May being 5-2, to two, favored on the morning line, but... She was terrible last time out. She did go very, very wide into the first turn. But other than that, she had nothing. And she could easily bounce back here. And Ice Queen was in perfect range. Ice Queen was a little white on the neck last time out. So if she's a little, you know, uh, a, little, a little drier, maybe she'll be. I think Ice Queen's dangerous. I would definitely use the two. But there are others in here, too. I'm just taking two long shots because I'm trying to say that this is. A very difficult race. You make an excellent point, Frank, on your top pick, number one, a crown for Kish, a crown for Kitten. And the reason why I say that is I was down at Delmar on November 25th when she broke her maiden. And as you mentioned, she went off at 34 to 1. 
All you got to do is cover up her last two running lines and take a look at her performances before that comeback uh, victory. And it was really a head scratcher to me. Usually I can explain where that horse's performance came from. In this particular case, I couldn't. But more importantly, off that comeback race and that maiden victory, you can see she improved from a buyer speed figure standpoint, five additional points. So she's actually trending in the right direction. You mentioned she's reunited with Van Dyke. It's just her third off the left. There are, she's a daughter of Kittens Joy. There are things to like, and 15 to 1 sure seems like a huge overlay with, you know, kind of mapping it out that way. It's a wide open race, is the point of the third. Nothing would surprise me. And therefore, I'm going to pick a price over one of those three to one or five to twos in there because it's hard to take a short price on any of those. Hard to trust them because, like, for example, even though I thought Ice Queen ran a very good race last time out, she did take dead aim on the top two and didn't make up any headway in the stretch. And she is in that perfect spot. You angle out, you're supposed to get there but the other not you can't take it away from her the other two were just a little better than her and Bally dancer was the one that if you if she was four to one last time out people would be thinking like wow but she was 40 to one so people might think it's a fluke she did run very well in defeat and was well you know well clear of everyone other than ice queen it should be noted that ice queen since shipping to southern california has not appeared in the winner's circle she hasn't won in the last two years as a matter of fact but she, she does switch over to umberto recently but as you mentioned frank she's going to be a short price particularly in comparison to a crown for kitten yeah race number four is 50 cent late pick five time we're sprinting six and a half furlongs in the main track sixteen thousand dollars is the claiming tag two scratches scratch the four and six leaves us with a field of five number five established dropping off a victory is now in for sixteen thousand likely to lower than the nine to five morning line uh more, the morning line that uh, he is particularly with those two scratches i don't like established i don't know how you feel about the race but it always concerns me when trainers and connections drop off a win i know the condition book this and that but they're begging to basically lose him and he was a void claim two races back having spieled all that what's your opinion i don't like him either but i, I mean look the one thing you got to like about him is his record 19 starts six wins for it. he's what's honest to get rid of him there was something you got to move on sometimes. Turn the page. Turn the page. <laughs> Here's the thing about that race, and I did not watch the replay of this one last night. I remembered it, and I remember I said something to the effect at the end of how game he was because he never looked like he's winning. But, the, like, in remembering that race, I wasn't impressed with any of that. Like, in other words, him, Next Revolt, Italiano, I'm not impressed with any of that group. I don't want any part of them in this race. There was something like, you know, you just get that feeling yeah. right then, like that wasn't the it race. It wasn't visually impressive. It just... Like, I don't even know how this horse held on last time. He's supposed to get run over in that race, and he didn't. And maybe that's, you know, maybe he's just ultra game, or maybe the others just weren't that good. But I'm throwing everyone out of that race. <laughs> no disrespect, even though I'm showing them much disrespect right we now. know what's going to happen. Establish will win by the length of the stretch. He might. But not with our money. No chance. I like Horn of Plenty right back. I mean, sometimes you just have to say to yourself, what was wrong with that? This horse took some serious action last time out. He was coming out of like, if you look at him closely, he wasn't a crazy pick last time out if anyone made money on him because he was coming out of a starter allowance, which brings out all kinds of horses. And then previously, you know, he was in for like 25 and in some other kind of race, like 1,000 yards. And if you look back at his form, like, at Lone Star, and then even when he got to Del Mar, he was taking action. So I think last time out, but I just remember this horse looked good on the track and ran accordingly. Now, the one box of chocolates was far back, didn't have the best of beginnings, came flying, and gets the services of uh, of uh, Jonathan Wong now off the claim. We just saw that win yesterday right off the claim. And so part of me would say, okay, going from Oscar Heredia to Jonathan Wong is a positive enough move to maybe close the gap. But in the end... I'm just going to trust that Horn of Plenty looked good. That was his first start at Santa Anita. Why can't he come right back and win again? That was a good effort. Yeah, he got a good trip, but he finished it up, and he won. And Box of Chocolates did close a lot of ground from way out of it. But I just think from a looking at their stride type of thing, Horn of Plenty is a better, more efficient mover, and I think he's the better horse. So I'm just going to go 3-1 knowing that if a horse right claim from Jonathan Wong is trying to close the gap on us late, it could get ugly for those who went to to try to beat Box of Chocolates. But I like Horn of Plenty. He, he looked like he liked it here. He won beautifully, and, and he looked good. He was shiny and, and looked good on the track and ran accordingly. I think he offers some good value today. Horn of Plenty, <clears throat> excuse me, Horn of Plenty was 20 to 1 on the morning line. As you mentioned, Frank went off at 9 to 1. Also earned a career best buyer speed figure of 75, but a confident boost up in class from his connections, which certainly bodes well from a positivity standpoint. 50 cent late pick four begins in race number five. We're sprinting six furlongs in the turf course. Main special weight, three-year-old fillies. Couple of changes here. Scratch the six, also make the jockey a number one. 
Woody, Frankie DeTore, morning line favorite, Tina Ella, the uh, daughter of Beholder, first time turf. Beholder never ran on the turf. Her other progeny have never tried the turf. Do you think uh, Tina Ella will like the turf today? Well, she could because her daddy, Warfront, is a, yes. a beast of a turf star. Happy belated birthday to Warfront, who had a birthday yesterday, as I saw on the Claiborne Farm uh, um, Twitter feed. Warfront's an absolute gorilla at stud. This is a beautifully bred individual, but I didn't use her. Who did you use? I used number one, Woody. Woody was terrible last time with a capital T. Like, you can't watch that race and say, I can't wait to be As an even money favorite. She was really dreadful on that day. And so they're going right to the turf. But her debut was good. She she took the lead early. She went into the turn. And and then Lily Poo, who was knocking on the door, had just finished second to Faza, who's a multiple winner for Bob Baffert. Um, and Lily Poo ran down Woody that day. So Woody should have been even money last time out. But she was just very flat. They're moving to the turf now. Frankie DeTore climbs aboard. She's got speed from the inside. Maybe she didn't like the good track. Maybe she didn't like the Santa Anita main track. I don't know. I don't think she's nearly as bad as that race indicates. Maybe the turf wakes her up with speed on the rail. And that's why I went to her. My second pick is the nine Crimson Sonata. I think Dean Pedersen is a good under the radar uh, trainer for first time starters doesn't you know he hasn't had enough this year to prove that but over the many years that I've called Dean Pedersen runners he comes ready to roll this horse is by Mendelssohn they spent 120,000 for her bred by the great Samsung farm the dam ran five times three wins all of them on turf I will say this I personally don't look at workout reports and it's not because I don't respect or like them I think they're extremely important and the sharpest handicappers do use them but uh, my buddy sent me a text last night, and he warned you were me. Busy last night. I was getting watching you know, replays, getting my, text. My text, the text, having dinner with some uh, Eddie Friends. Logan uh, yeah. candidates. Irish Rose, the five, supposedly is working well. And you know, my theory is this: if you tell me something, my job is to pass that on. Someone I know who I respect told me watch out for the five, but I didn't pick her, nor did I pick her second. But I would say use her if you want. Let me add to number five, Irish Rose. She's actually a full sister to Tofino Bay. You might remember also trained by Neil Drysdale. What did uh, Tofino Bay do? She won her debut at 35 to 1, winning six furlongs on the turf course. Now, I'm not saying I like Irish Rose today. You should. But the pedigree is there, obviously, right? So this is a full sister. And you also mentioned Crimson Sonata. I can tell you the dam of Crimson Sonata actually won her debut sprinting six and a half furlongs on the turf course at Woodbine in a maiden special weight. However, her foals are 0 for 6 so far as first-time starters. Good news and bad news both about Crimson Sonata. Sonata and Irish Rose, another difficult race, which is why I said this is actually a pretty good. It's a uh, tough race. Sunday card. What's wrong with Foolish? She ran well. Yes, it was a sixty-two-five tag, but she ran you know, great. She, I mean, she made that big move, and then kind I of. I mean, that was in the time when Pratt was getting a lot of seconds in a row, and look, look some, who beat her that day. Yes, it's I a, claimed, yeah. Brett came back yesterday and finished third in the Sweet Life for trainer yeah. Peter Miller off the claim. There you go. Race and number. Gary Barber silks. Exactly. You can't miss those, can you? Never. They're legendary silks, and they should be green instead of pink. Race number six. We're going one mile on the main track for maiden special weight three year olds. A field of seven. Jockey change on number four. Riverside make the jockey. Kazushi Kamora, morning line favorite right inside, is number three. Yellow, bo- yellow brick from the Richard Mandela barn. Yellow brick is going two turns now for the second time in his career. I should say in his career. Well clear last time out, losing to a Bob Baffert beast. What say you about race six? I, I don't like yellow brick. I love yellow brick. I think yellow brick graduates today. I thought he ran well last time out. Uh, when he made his debut, I thought I'm waiting for this horse to go long. Last time he didn't break that well, and he was never going to beat Harlow Cap. Harlow Cap was very sharp. He was well clear of the rest. He's supposed to win today. Um, I will say this. The number five Skinner, we talked about this, and I won't get into it. I don't like horses that return from grade ones in the maiden company, but Skinner has been in my stable mail, and I don't know why. This might have been some steam before he ran, and obviously if it was, it was bad steam. But nevertheless, he does get Lasix today, and um, – the dam was a nice mare named Winding Way. Won and won won the Rancho Bernardo one year and finished second in it one year. That's one of my favorite races down at Del Mar for fillies and mares. But Skinner's in my stable mail. I got to trust. I don't remember why I put it in, but I'm going three five in that order. Uh, I love the three yellow brick. He if he doesn't win today, it, it's going to be surprising to me. You have to filter steam, right? In other words, there's good steam. Steam is terrible. Steam. If you never get steam as long as you live, you're better off. <laughs> it's the worst steam. thing ever. Especially you, right? Everyone. I mean, the steam is like, literally, you get the worst horses from people. I mean, it, inf- it could potentially influence. It can influence. Potential- it, it has influenced me for 40 years. It's ridiculous. I wish, I beg people not to send me steam. I don't think I've ever given you steam. Uh, thank Maybe you. on Twitter, but not certainly. Let me you know. thank you. Okay. Let me thank you in advance. Because <laughs> steam seven. is tough to resist. 
Race number seven begins the $1 Golden Hour Pick 4, a great wager that you should get involved with. It uh, combines our last two races here with the last two races at Golden Gate. We kick it off here in race number seven, sprinting five and a half furlongs on the main track for Maine claiming Phillies and Mares. $20,000 is the claiming tag. Here's another good field of nine because number nine, Thunder Run, did scratch. Moy line favor from the Steve Knapp bar. Number five, Sugar Sugar. Three to one on the Moy line. Three to one kind of indicates that John White thinks this might be an open race. John White knows this is an open race, and here's what I know. I want as little experience as possible and as new a face as humanly possible in this race. So what am I going to do? I'm going right to spoiled rotten. First time Lasix, well bet against much better, has not run in a long, long time, well over a year. And uh, guess what? I like that because anything I've seen recently, just kind of fighting it out for minor awards in these maiden 20s, I'll pass on. I have no idea how the workouts are. That might help you. I, I haven't looked at them, but I will say spoiled rotten to me. This just has the look of an $8.20 winner, like bet down late, eight twenty. see you later, wins by seven. The bar knows, right? They're all in. Super and this, Bowl is, this is where you need steam. Right. You need steam on firsters and droppers. That's where, if you can get legitimate steam, this is where you need it. Hey, and Doug. look at them on the pat. Uh, you got to call them Doug. Them. Brother, brother, shake and bake. What about this six horse coming back today? That's where you need steam. If there's time to call your friends, this is it. My second pick is the two Macho Queen for Phil Oviedo, who has one of the best smiles in the history of horse racing. Very nice man. I'm a big fan of Phil Oviedo's. I'll go back way back with him to the Turf Paradise days. Macho Queen is dropping into the softest spot of her career. And uh, maybe gets a piece here because I don't like any of the horses that have been just kind of just missing at the 20 level. Our final race is actually our feature race. It's the Lady of Shamrock Stakes, $100,000 guarantee going one mile a turf for three-year-old fillies. Also, it begins the $5 golden hour daily double. One jockey change, make the jockey number four, A.G. Bullet, Frankie DeTore, the morning line favorite on a two-race win streak is number three, the Wild Grazer, two to one on the morning line. We know she likes to sprint. Does she like to route? I like two horses on today's card a lot after all this talking for a half an after hour. After 40 minutes, you come with two horses. Yellow like. Brick okay. is the one I really like. All right. And my best bet of the day is right here, right before the Super Bowl, the number three, the Wild Grazer, right back. And here is why. She was very impressive last time out down the hill. But more importantly than that, in the pre-race interview here at Santa Anita Park, they were interviewing Jeff Mullins. And forgive me for not remembering which one of our great on-air Talent was with them in, with him in the paddock and asked about this horse. And Jeff went on to say, and I'm paraphrasing and giving a general theme of what he said was, I've been wanting to route this filly. However, she's not the easiest to handle. And so what he basically instructed Juan Hernandez is, hopefully when they go down the hill and all that stuff happens, whatever, when they straighten up, hopefully she'll just come with one run. And not only did it, she took aim and blew right by the competition, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, Wait for her to route. I love the Wild Grazer in here. Let's talk about her main competition. T in conversation, broke her maiden last time out, and then was drilled by Broadway Girls, who's in this race. Pass. AG Bullet came back flying. She, You know what? That was a sneaky long shot pick if anyone had her. It's easy to say in post race, but it was Papa Padromo with a horse that was going to show speed, trying the turf with twirling candy and forestry on the bottom she aired and she won for fun let me say this i mean the reason that margin went from six to three and a quarter is joe bravo had both feet on the brakes late in that race this horse was gone she'll be on the lead today uh the seven broadway girls the only reason i'm taking a little bit of a stand against her and it's not necessarily fair to her i don't like when horses show that they're good at something try something else and then return to it so otherwise i would pick her second I'm picking the six quickly park at second with Jessica Pfeiffer. This Philly showed some nice little ability. Uh, Prospect Park, her sire, was a beautiful horse. She won a couple races, including a stake over Golden Gate. I'm gonna, but she was well bet and a couple of good stakes since then. I'm gonna, but I, I just love, I mean, love the wild grazer in here. This is like a 10 star Frank pick. Those of you wearing sunglasses to deflect the reflection from Frank Miramati's shirt can now take them off because this is the conclusion of the seminar. Frank, so, thanks so much for your time and input today. You do a tremendous job. Thank We're you, lucky sir. to have you as the track announcer here. Keep up the great work. Thank you. And please tread lightly with these selections. Sometimes I get a little bit overly enthusiastic. So a $2 win wager would be about all I'd recommend. And keep in mind, we also offer the Coast to Coast Pick 5 wager, combining races from both Gulfstream Park and Sanita. That will kick off at Gulfstream Park with a $1 minimum and a low 
remote takeout as well at 12.37 uh, p.m. Pacific time. First leg goes as Gulfstream Park race number eight. Also keep in mind, live racing will resume here at the Great Race Place this coming Friday. And this coming Friday represents the start of a four-day holiday week of racing. That's right. We'll uh, race next Monday, which is a special holiday. So four days of racing uh, next week. But before then, enjoy the races. Enjoy the big game. Have fun and good luck.